From job losses to businesses closing and increased food insecurity, the COVID-19 pandemic is having a devastating effect on Hawaii's economy. Tourism has restarted across the state, but the numbers are nowhere close to pre-pandemic rates. And there's still the task of balancing health and safety with making up for financial shortfalls. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. The disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic is far reaching. Beyond the health impact is the financial hardship that can be felt at the workplace and at home. Hawaii's unemployment rate skyrocketed, businesses are closing and the state is facing a massive budget shortfall. Our panel tonight includes representatives of local businesses and tourism, the Speaker of the State House and the head of a major nonprofit. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests who are appearing via the internet. Scott Psyche was just re-elected to serve another two years in the State House of Representatives. He will retain his position as House Speaker and also serves as co-chair of the House COVID-19 Committee. John DeFries is president and CEO of the Hawaii Tourism Authority, a job he was hired for in September. Born and raised in Waikiki, he most recently resided on Hawaii Island and has worked in the tourism industry for four decades. Ron Mizutani is the president and CEO of the Hawaii Food Bank. Since the start of the pandemic, the nonprofit has been organizing food drives on Oahu and Kauai and has distributed millions of pounds of food. Tina Yamaki is president of the Retail Merchants of Hawaii. She has more than 20 years experience with nonprofit organizations, community relations, and governmental affairs. And Monica Taguchi Ryan is the third generation owner of the Highway Inn restaurants in Waipahu and Kaka'ako, Oahu. Her grandparents started the business in 1947. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. John, I want to start with you in the news today announced by the governor. You know, we've had Trans-Pacific Travel now open for about a month uh, with some success. Can you tell us how it's going and also the new requirements laid out for testing by the governor? Well, for the past 35 days since we resumed uh, Trans-Pacific Travel, as expected, it's been uh, a very slow and gradual process. We're averaging be between six and 8,000 arrivals uh, daily about anywhere from 40 to 50% of that are actually people on vacation. And um, in the early weeks, there were a number of uh, glitches in the arrival and the screening process, also getting the trusted test partners uh, totally activated, which is a, quite a feat when you're trying to open a national network like that. But over the last several weeks, things have refined themselves. Today's announcement, um, is a serious uh, restriction now being imposed where uh, your pre-travel uh, test needs to be negative and uploaded into your safe travels program. And if not, uh, you will uh, be going into a self-quarantine for 14 days or the, the, the length of your trip that's shorter. Um, the governor made that, I'm obligated uh, on behalf of HTA to align with that. But I also know it's placing tremendous uh, concern and, and pressures on the actual uh, hotel operators. And, and I've heard from a number of them since the announcement, concerned that every time there's a restriction put in place, as well-intentioned as it is, and advocating the safety of our local people, it's putting additional pressure on uh, these business enterprises. And so the, the next three or four days, I expect some fallout to happen and we'll have more to report on at that time. You know, speaking of restrictions, Monica, I know the restaurant industry has uh, faced quite a few of them. Can you tell us about how business has changed for you and, uh, and what you're facing right now as a small business owner, particularly as a restaurant? Gosh, that's a that's a really loaded question. Um, it, it's been really challenging for us, obviously, since March, and then we saw a bit of a trickle upwards in the summer. It, it 
it seems to be following a typical trend. Um, I think restaurants are very similar to retail where you typically see an increase in, in, in business during the summer. And then once school starts in the fall, you see a dip. Um, I definitely will say that um, the second shutdown did affect us. We did see um, less traffic coming in, but then when we reopened and we entered into tier two and, and tourism opened up, uh, we definitely did see um, a boost. And, and I wanna also mention that at the same time, the Hawaii restaurant card came out. And so that was a huge boost um, to the restaurant industry. It came at a, at a very much needed time um, and now with the restaurant card, we're seeing a little bit of trickle downwards um, and looking forward to the second round of the pool recipients receiving these cards. Um, but I, I thought that was uh, kudos to the people that were involved in this program. And uh, I, I think it was a great use of CARES money, very targeted program. You know, Tina, the uh, DBED has estimated that 25% of Hawaii's businesses have closed down. How accurate do you think that is? How do we know how many have actually sh closed their doors? You know, we're really not going to find out until, you know, everyone is able to open and we're kind of back on the economy is going up again. Um, when businesses open up, you always see them having press releases and all of that. But when businesses close, they close quietly. You find out about it on social media because somebody says, hey, they're having a going out of business. Or um, when you're passing by, you notice that the shop is boarded up and the signs are gone. Um, so it's really hard to tell. And we're hearing that at least one business is closing almost every day. And I think you hero is also um, estimating that 40% of the businesses are going to go under by the time this pandemic is over. Um, of course, you hero being the the uh, the economic uh, forecasters from the University of Hawaii. Can you tell us a little bit more about what businesses you've seen at most at risk? You know, everybody thinks that it's the smaller businesses that are at risk, but we're also seeing that it's also national companies that have been closing down um, or going bankrupt. Some businesses have just changed their business model where they're not doing brick and mortar, where they're doing only online sales right now. So they closed their brick and mortars for right now. Um, but it's across the board. It doesn't matter if you're a small mom and pop family owned with a couple of employees or you're a large business, you know, with 400 employees, you know, it's this pandemic is affecting everybody. Well, and, and Ron, you've seen that firsthand. I know that the food bank has done amazing work. Some of those uh, long lines outside of Aloha Stadium, especially in March and April when this all first hit, where are the needs right now? Are, you know, we saw those huge lines. We're not seeing drives like that in the same way anymore, but where are the needs that you're seeing right now? Well, we, we have, change the way we do distributions. Uh, one of the things that you will notice is we're being better neighbors and we're being uh, you know, more strategic in implementation of these distributions. So that's why you're not seeing massive lines, although we did have a, a large distribution at the stadium on this past Monday of 2,500 families. So we, we're doing things more efficiently, which is taking cars off the street. I can tell you now though, that the needs have not stopped. And, and every person that spoke just, just now in the last few minutes, Everything that they say, we see at the we see as well. So once the restaurants close, we see that in people in the line. Once this today's decision by the, the governor is going to be a game changer, not just for everybody on this on this call tonight, but also for Hawaii Food Bank. We will see the ripple effect of that if more businesses shut, if hotels shut down, the people who would be employed or who return to work will return back to the lines and, and raising their hand for food assistance. 19 and a half million pounds of food we've distributed on Oahu and Kauai since March. Those are staggering real numbers and the numbers have not stopped. October, 3 million pounds distributed and in November we're on pace to do the same. Speaker Spikey, what's your view on the governor's action and also how do we balance public health and safety with of course the economic needs that we have as a state? Well, you know, um, I. I learned about the governor's decision um, when he held his press conference today and when I saw the written press release. I wasn't aware that he was uh, planning to make, make this drastic change um, in policy. You know, I, I know that the governor has been under a lot of pressure um, from day one from each of the mayors of the four counties. Um, the mayors are very concerned about the health of and safety of their of the residents on their islands. And I, you know, I totally I get it and I understand that. Um, the key, as we've said, as many people have said over and over again,
the key to a healthy economy in Hawaii is a healthy uh, population, healthy people. And um, it's, just, it's just really important that, uh, that the state uh, maintains um, that we have a, a program of, of screening and test contact tracing and testing um, and uh, to protect people's health because that is the key. You know, the New York Times um, does a survey of all of the states and Hawaii is the only state in the category that has the lowest number of cases and where, and where the cases remain low. We're the only state in that category. And it's really important. It's really important that we stay there. I want to stick with you for a second, Mike from Makiki, and of course we do welcome all of you to call, tweet, Facebook, message us your questions. Um, Mike from Makiki has a question directly for the speaker. He says, economic alternatives, is there an, ec an update on economic alternatives to tourism from Alan Oshima and also the, the COVID-19 task force? Um, well, the, the COVID task force will be pivoting, will be focusing on some um, e economic strategy, um, but in the meantime, um, you know, we have been very focused on the travel, the travel policies and the pretest programs. Uh, we've been trying to monitor that um, and to monitor the governor and his administration uh, to make sure that we have a program that makes sense. Um, you know, the bottom line is that tourism um, in the short term is an industry that we have to, we have to prop up because that is going to bring the most immediate relief to the largest number of people in our state. John, I want to get your thoughts on tourism overall. We've, we, you know, we, as you noted at the top, that we've seen more of a trickle than, of course, a flood of visitors coming in since the state is essentially starting from scratch uh, when it comes to attracting visitors. We've talked for years about how we want to pivot to a higher spend tourist or a different kind of tourist. Is there a potential to do that? And, and you know, what kind of tourists uh, is HTA trying to pursue right now? You know, right now, um, there are enough national surveys about the, the fear and anxiety in the market about travel in total. So it's, it's at this particular time when we're trying to um, sustain a relaunch, the, the, the actual targeting of, of visitors may, is almost premature. I mean, right now, it's about perfecting the systems uh, speaker psyche was critical in in helping us get the Japan trans-pacific travel set up and the the test partners there and so right now I would say that the our interest is in being able to sustain this slow uh, gradual recovery because another shutdown would would be devastating um, to our industry and and the more strategic, types of marketing programs uh, have been set up uh, for Japan and the US. But at the moment, um, we are right now trying to convey consistent messaging about the safety measures that have been put in place to protect our local people as well as the inbound visitor. Monica, I would like to get your thoughts as a, as a restaurant owner. How critical are these tourists to your business and businesses like yours? Can you survive on the Kamaina economy, um, or do you need these visitors to make it through the next six, eight months to a year? Um, you know, I think that's a great question. Some of us, you know, there, there are businesses out there that are directly impacted uh, by, by tourism, and there are those of us who... Um, I think all of us in Hawaii are going to be affected in some capacity. Um, restaurants, I just want to make a point with restaurants. There's also different categories of, of restaurants, fast food, chain restaurants, local independents, and other types of food service operators like park concessions. And what we've seen during COVID is there, there are actually some winners through this. Fast food chains have done particularly well. Domino's have, been, have done particularly well. Uh, but what I've seen, you know, personally is that the local independent restaurants have, have really, really um, uh, struggled during this time. Um, there are two kinds of different demographics. We, we have a location in Waipahu, obviously, uh, and we have one in Kaka'ako. So it's very hard to say that they're affected um, similarly uh, based on tourism. Obviously, in Kaka'ako, we're much more closer to Waikiki. So we do see about a third of our customer base were tourists. Um, the other thing, and, and this is um, first time I was able to see the Hawaii tourism uh, report. They have a daily report that comes out. And you know, there's a lot of people that travel to come and visit family and friends. 
Um, and so a lot of our business in Kaka'aka also included uh, people that were bringing family and friends into the restaurants. Uh, Waipahu, on the other hand, um, is mostly a, a local clientele. We did, we de did see uh, our Waipahu location affected, but perhaps not as greatly as our Kaka'aka location. And lastly, we, we have a, a cafe at the Bishop Museum and the museum has been profoundly affected by the drop in tourism. You know, Tina, we talked about the restaurants, or not restaurants, but businesses overall that have closed down. Once a business has shut down, how likely is it to reopen? Let's say in a year from now, you know, if we do have a vaccine and, and we are kind of through the worst of this. I think some businesses have just given up. I mean, they just can't afford it. You know, the largest monthly expense that any business has is commercial um, lease, rent kind of thing. And you know, if they haven't been able to pay it, you know, it, it's hard because you still have to pay your taxes, you still have to pay your utilities, there's still operational expenses just because you close. And these dollar amounts have been adding up, you know, with the first shutdown, it wasn't too bad for some because they could do online sales and a lot of businesses, they pivoted to the point where, you know, they took their entire inventory where people couldn't go into their store and they put it online and they figured out a way to make it work. They couldn't hire photographers. So they used their staff or themselves or family and they took pictures and they said, Hey, you know, this is a great outfit uh, when you're at home on the couch, watching Netflix kind of thing, you know, or this is a great zoom outfit. Um, so they did things like that, or they did, you know, YouTube kind of things. Um, but as we're going forward, it's just harder to, to see who's actually going to survive. And, um, you know, I have some statistics too. There was a, there were two surveys that came out um, and it said that one in three businesses reported extreme hardship and 59.7% um, paid their rent in full and 30.8 paid partially. And of that also 9.45 didn't pay their rent at all. And it's expected that two of the three, two and three retailers are expected to miss rental payments by the end of this year. And we are affected by tourism too. You know, it's, it's the story of that $20 bill. Tourist comes to Hawaii, pays with a $20 bill at the hotel. The hotel pays that worker, um, front desk worker with the $20 bill. Front desk worker takes that $20 bill, buys a plate lunch. Um, the plate lunch wagon lady takes that $20 bill and goes to the local farmer to buy vegetables. The local farmer gives the $20 bill to the delivery guy, you know, to deliver the um, fruits and vegetables. And then the delivery guy takes that $20 and buys shoes for his child. So when somewhere in there breaks, you know, everybody is affected. And, and Ron, you talked about that too, even with the governor's announcement that you're anticipating a trickle down effect uh, from that. And probably, you know, as we see the cases on the mainland rise and we don't know how many visitors are actually coming, how many of those jobs are really secure. Um, do, does the food bank have the resources it needs to meet the needs of the community? That's a good question. Right now, so the, the key is just basic economics, supply and demand. Can we match supply with the increase in demand? So far, we've been able to do that, and that's just through the generosity of our very giving community, foundation support, philanthropy, uh, organizations, new relationships, and cultivating new relationships. A lot of silver linings in what we've experienced uh, as a food bank. We've also become more efficient as an organization. The question is, what's going to look like tomorrow? And the reality is, we don't know. Uh, and we cannot rely only on donations. I can tell you though, the inventory issue is a real concern for all food banks across the country. We're in the same queue as everybody else. And uh, we get orders canceled all the time, almost daily from distributors on the mainland. That's why we've been purchasing local, uh, our local farmers. We purchased about $1.25 million worth of island fresh grown produce that the families are receiving. We're investing right back into our ranchers, our long line fishermen, as well as our poultry and, and, and eggs and everything else. We've been going local and that's a good thing. You know, we're keeping our economy going that way as well, starting the conversations about sustainability. But is that a, a business model that we can sustain? Not without donations and that's how we survive. If you look at our annual budget of purchasing food, it's because we have such a generous community you know, with retailers and, and, and shops and Safeways of the world donating their food to us, that's come to a stop. So we've had to purchase food. So a $400,000 annual budget has now increased to $8.5 million. As of this week, it's now 8.6 million. That doesn't just happen. 
And uh, that happens through hard work, but also, you know, the giving community that we call home. And can that continue? Donor fatigue is very real. And as we head into the holidays, folks are going to start thinking about their own as well. And that's understandable. Uh, the, what's behind 2021 is unknown. And, uh, you know, we, we are hopeful that this reboot of the visitor industry was going to help. Uh, today's announcement, like I said, is a game changer. And we will see the ripple effect. There's no doubt about it. But tell, tell us those numbers again, because that's quite staggering. You said $400,000 in a typical year, and you've spent how much this year? $8.6 million, that's just on food. Uh, and that's because we've had to purchase like never, ever before. And we're not unique. Uh, you know, food banks across the country have purchased more food than they ever have had to. Hawaii, though, we're a little bit different. Obviously, our geographic isolation, you know, we, have, we rely on, on shipping. Shipping has not been the problem. It's just inventory. There's a lot of distributors who make mac and cheese and they can't even keep pace. So we, in turn, turn around and we purchase local beef. We purchase local proteins. We buy Kahlua pig. We're buying fresh produce. Our farmers love Hawaii Food Bank. We've kept many of them afloat. And, and you know, that's a good thing come post-COVID. But right now, that's going to be hard to sustain. And uh, the reality is we, we, are, we are really in uncharted waters uh, as we head into 2021. They had a lot of unknowns. I mean, Mr. Speaker, that, that that number is just staggering to go from that that budget to that purchasing. Uh, and the well is running dry at the state as well. It's not like the state can afford to bail out the food bank or anyone else right now. Are you anticipating furloughs for next year and or layoffs? And, and where do you see that money coming from? The state, uh, of course, is facing a tremendous shortfall. Yeah, so when the legislature goes into our regular session in uh, mid-January, you know, one of the first things and one of the top priorities that we'll have to, we'll be working on is um, to address the state budget. So um, we are anticipating that there will be a $1.2 billion shortfall. And this is out of our uh, general fund budget. The general fund budget is comprised of the state tax revenue. And the general fund budget is about $8 billion. So that's, you're talking about $1 billion out of $8 billion. And um, we are going to um, see um, how we can address that shortfall. We do not want to furlough government workers because government workers are providing really important services. I mean, everybody who's on the Zoom tonight has had to interact with government agencies that are helping them um, provide their services. So we don't want to see furloughs happen. Um, and um, I think that in the, in the first year, we'll probably have to rely on a lot of accounting gimmicks and, and short term, some short term um, uh, solutions uh, to address the budget. But I mean, what kind of accounting gimmicks, gimmicks if you will, can get you out of $1.2 billion? Yeah, so, you know, there's, 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 the, there's things you can consider things like um, um, grabbing, saving unspent funds from the prior year, transferring funds from one account to another account. I'm trying to make up for the shortfall. I mean, it, was, it probably won't add up to a billion dollars, but we'll try to do that as much as possible. Of course, one thing that could help a lot for the economy is Christmas visitors. John, we have a question from someone also named John on Facebook who says, what are you folks anticipating for Christmas break? Do you think families will travel? And, you know, also, does that put our state at risk? What are you thinking for the Christmas holiday? Hawaii, of course, is a huge family destination for Christmas, but I would imagine that a lot of families have some trepidation about bringing children and traveling at this, at this time of year. So what's the outlook for Christmas? You know, we're seeing it um, already. I mean, any of the forecasts that people like myself provide would fundamentally pulling it out of the air because the, everything's so fluid that uh, today's decision will have an impact and, um, and the increased COVID spikes that are happening in some of our source markets will have an impact. And so I, I do think that we'll see um, in comparison to what happened in 2019, we'll be lucky to see something between 15, 18% of, of that, that volume. Um, but again, it's, it's something that's so fluid and, and we're getting information daily from airlines and, and from our different travel partners, but, but it's somewhat early to determine that. We expect some to take place, but too early to quantify right now, specifically. 
Monica, we have a question from Claude on Facebook who says, for independent restaurants, would you prefer that the public refrain from using gift cards pre-purchase because of the cash flow problems? What's the best way to support our local restaurants? You know, that's, that's actually a great question. Um, from an accounting perspective, uh, we, we, when somebody buys a gift card, uh, if they buy it now, obviously that, that does help us. If they use a gift card that was perhaps bought a while ago, then, then not so much. We, we just you know, account for it in, in our books. But definitely gift cards is one revenue stream. Uh, a lot of businesses or a lot of restaurants that have done really well with their curbside pickup, with their digital platforms, uh, with their, uh, if they have a drive-through, uh, they have been you know, the winners through all of this. And, and for many of us that are local independents, um, just coming in to support us. We actually installed, you know, for public safety, we recently installed uh, ionizers. And I'm not a, a biologist to be able to adequately explain this, but basically the ionizers have a positive and, and negative electron, which then somehow creates a chemical reaction on pathogens like COVID-19. Um, the other thing that people may not realize about restaurants is that in many modern restaurants, we have hoods above our, our hot equipment. And so these hoods will suck up the air. And what happens is we have 100% makeup air. So the air in, in restaurants, because of this type of system that we have, um, the air is constantly being replenished. Um, so along with the ionizers, I know CDC recently came out with a set study um, accusing restaurants uh, that we might be a place of, of transmission. And uh, the, the National Restaurant Association really pushed back on this because they were claiming, and I personally haven't read the study, but they were claiming that the methodology was flawed. Um, for those of us in the business, any type of negative uh, publicity like that really, really hurts us. But supporting local, supporting your, your local independent restaurants in whatever way you can, um, it's very, very helpful. I do wanna make a point about uh, a Christmas time. Um, I saw this one quote, better a Zoom Thanksgiving than an ICU uh, Christmas. And uh, I thought that was a very relevant. And we recently had a Thanksgiving special um, and we sold out 300 meals in less than a week. And, and I think that represents the demographic and consumer shift in the decisions that people are making. You know, they're not having big families, so they don't want the big turkey. It's really hard to find a small turkey. Um, and, and so many of the businesses that have had turkey specials have, have sold out um, very quickly. You know, Hawaii has some of the most restrictive rules in the country, especially uh, here in the city and county of Honolulu with the tier system. If we were to go into another lockdown, what would that mean for restaurants, do you think? How many, you know, could, could restaurants survive another lockdown, especially independent ones like yours? Yeah, um, you know, this is, this is the thing about government mandates, um, whether that's on the federal, state, or city level is that oftentimes, especially in the beginning, I think it became, it was such a public health issue and we didn't pay attention to the economic downside to it. And we didn't really know how long this was gonna last. I think most of us believe that this would take three months to resolve and we would be done. Now we're entering nine months into, into this pandemic. Um, but anytime there's a lockdown without any consideration for economic relief, uh, it's, it's very devastating uh, to businesses. I believe about 100,000 restaurants across the country have closed. Yelp put out uh, about 60% of business restaurants um, have been affected in some, some way or another. Um, so definitely if a shutdown occurs, you know, my only ask as a restaurant operator is that, you know, we'll see some level of federal, especially federal relief, um, uh, you know, coming through to, to help us because it is irresponsible to shut down a business and then expect that business to continue paying its fixed expenses that Tina mentioned, like rent or debt that you have with a bank, insurance. Those fixed long-term costs is what is really crippling uh, small businesses or even large businesses. We, we, we cannot be expected to have these mandates and then be expected to pay um, some of our other vendors. Tina, Dean from Oahu says, how are businesses adapting to the new normal? This virus isn't going away. Who are the businesses that are actually making this work? And, you know, th there were some other questions tonight about who might be hiring. You know, there's a lot of people right now who are looking for work. Are there any bright sp spots in uh, our economy as far as you can tell? You know, there are a lot of 
um, retailers that are hiring for holidays right now, but you know, it's, it's temporary work, you know, you're hired for this day until this day. Um, but we know there's a lot out there that are hiring. Uh, we're also seeing that, you know, businesses, especially retailers have had to pivot on how they do things. You know, like I said, mentioned before, they're selling more online, um, the way that they're, um, advertising too it's no longer you know buy one get one you know or this week's special you're seeing hey you know we're cleaning our stores you know constantly it's safe to come in we have hand sanitizers so they're really emphasizing that and you know retailers were one of the first businesses to really adapt to that where you know we put in the plastic guards between you and the cashier we constantly clean um you know the counter where you know you check out or the um pad that you put your credit card in and you know you have to wear masks we have hand sanitizers in there there's social distancing signs up and little markers on the floor so you know we take this very seriously you know we don't want to be a hot spot and um you know like monica said too you know a shutdown for us would be even more devastating the second shutdown a lot of retailers couldn't sell online so you know they close quietly which is really sad. And a lot of them are just trying to hang on through Christmas and trying to survive. Um, but yeah, you know, a lot of people also don't realize that, you know, it's not just buying at local businesses, but even the national um, retailers, they're the ones that hire our friends, our family and our neighbors. And they also bring in a lot of local vendors into the stores as well. So, you know, just because you're um, shopping at a national brand store, you know, you still are supporting Hawaii and buying local. John, let's talk about some of the workers who have been able to go back to work. Uh, you know, you were saying maybe 10 to 15 percent occupancy at some some hotels. That's clearly not where we need to be. But how many folks have been able to actually go back to work because of the reopening of travel? Do you have any sense of the numbers on that? Well, I don't have the, the actual numbers, but the, the hotels that have reopened have been operating between that 15 to 20 percent. There are a few of them that never closed and had government contracts that experienced 35 to 40 percent occupancies. Um, you know, a hotel owner today has a menu of ways to lose money, right? You can remain closed and lose money. You can open 30 percent of your hotel and lose money. And so going back to the points that were made earlier about the, the restrictions, and I'm not, I'm not questioning that whether the restrictions are needed or not. That's somebody else at the health department that is focused on that. In our industry, you know, we don't look at uh, the number of hospital beds on an island or ICU units on an island. Thank God somebody is. And I think going back to speaker's point earlier, uh, among those that look at it are the mayors and the mayors are having to to protect their island at the same time every one of the mayors and the governor knows that tourism offers the most efficient path to reopening so it's a constant balancing act i will tell you when i exited the governor's uh, press conference i wanted to get from he him and the lieutenant governor a perspective on what would happen i asked him i said what would happen if we had a vaccine january 1 what would that rollout look like? And, um, and there's a hierarchy of people who would get those vaccines first, starting with healthcare workers and working through the general public. But before the, the distribution to the general public, that could end up being the third quarter. And if that's the case, then tonight, we're not even at halftime in a game. We've still got the remaining of the second quarter, the third quarter and fourth quarter before we can get there. And, and so we're going to need to, to find a way to sustain ourselves through an extended period that lays ahead, actually. You know, Speaker Psyche, when you hear that, uh, if we're not even through the first quarter, that's a pretty tough road ahead. Um, and the CARES Act money, as we know, is expiring at the end of the year. We're still waiting on the federal government for CARES Act too. Who knows if and when that will happen. Um, when CARES Act money goes away, we will lose a lot of the unemployment support uh, for DL DLIR. Uh, we will lose also, of course, some of the National Guard that have been helping with the contact tracing, uh, along with a number of other state services that are directly related to the pandemic. What are you concerned about with the CARES Act funding going away and no new money in the pipeline? So one of the, one of the uh, 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 
priorities that we have now is to make sure that the state spends down the $1.25 billion that was um, given to us a few months ago. Um, and so far, the state um, has, I think it's tried hard, but it has not spent all of those funds down. Uh, the governor's plan is to um, deposit whatever is left over, what is unspent into the unemployment fund, because unemployment fund will be depleted at some point. Uh, so I think his priority is to is to keep the U, U, unemployment fund solvent. In addition to the $1.25 billion um, CARES uh, allocation, there was a second allocation of CARES funds to the state, which does not have the same December 31st deadline. And those funds total about $2 billion. Um, those $2 billion is allocated for specific kinds of programs. And um, you know, for example, there might be food programs, juvenile programs, uh, housing programs. Uh, we're going to work to make sure that the state spends on those funds as well. Um, I think there will be opportunities for nonprofit organizations to help administer um, those that, that spend down. Uh, but it's going to be critical that we do that. It's also going to be critical that the federal government um, reauthorize CARES funds because every state, every jurisdiction in the United States will need additional federal support. I mean, Ron, when you hear that, that we could be just in the first quarter, uh, what goes through your mind and, and what are you anticipating for the folks who will be coming to you for help? I even think we might even just be in the pregame. I mean, it's that the, the uncertainty of what's ahead um, is, is really, we're just estimated guests right now, especially when it comes to projecting what's gonna look like in 2021. I can tell you though, the, well, the face of hunger has obviously changed because of the pandemic. Uh, you know, hunger is a crisis for so many families every day, but this pandemic has really uh, created a, another um, layer that we have never seen before. So if you look at some of the distrib distributions that we've had, we do some data get, get gathering and collecting as well. So we know uh, who's on the line, if you will, receiving food and, and raising their hands for assistance. Um, through some of the stadium distributions, 78 to 83 percent of the vehicles in line uh, were impacted by COVID in some way in employment, whether they were fired or let go, rather, uh, whether they were furloughed, uh, whether the business just dissolved and, and be eliminated. Uh, that's a high number. That's a staggering number. And that tells us that a lot of those families have never raised their hand before uh, for assistance. Nonprofits have carried the day in our, in our, in our communities and not just Hawaii Food Bank. I mean, there's so many nonprofits that are doing excellent work right now. And some of them are on the front line as well with some of our first responders, including some of our team members, uh, exposing themselves. And when they do that, they expose their families as well. So, you know, my cup will always be half full, but I do agree with John. I mean, we're just very early in this, this game. And um, unfortunately, we don't know when halftime is or let alone when the final gun will sound. Uh, vaccine distribution will be very critical and key. And I, I hope the plan is unveiled quickly. And it's a robust plan that's real meaningful and detailed because the community is going to be anxious about that. Uh, we already are getting questions even within our own industry. When will that next tier? I mean, uh, granted, our first responders need to be our, our medical people, our doctors and our nurses, they need to get that first. But then what's the next tier? That plan needs to be communicated as soon as possible. Speaker Saiki, what, what are your thoughts on that? What, what does the tier system look like? I know that Lieutenant Governor is in charge of that vaccine rollout, but what can you tell us about um, who might be first in line after the first responders? Yeah, so we the House, um, the House of Representatives created a new committee this year. Um, it's going to be called the Pandemic and Disaster Preparedness Committee, and it's going to be chaired by Representative Linda Ichiyama. And so Representative Ichiyama's uh, responsibility is to uh, kind of oversee and to make sure that the state's um, infrastructure to deal with pan the pandemic um, is, you know, is, is solid. And the vaccination program is one of the areas that she will be focusing on. She's already begun work with the Department of Health to develop the tier system. I don't think there's been a final uh, decision yet on, on, on uh, who would be given priority, um, but I'm assuming there'll be a mix of first responders, uh, med medical personnel, um, and and um, uh, maybe um, educational uh, workers, uh, but there has been no decision, final decision yet. 
I want to stay with you. Uh, we have a question here from uh, via Facebook. Um, obviously, we've talked about furloughs and layoffs and cuts, but what about new revenue sources? This question from Facebook says, uh, from John says, what is your opinion on legalizing gambling and recreational marijuana? The tax revenue could help Hawaii tremendously. Um, those two areas, or are there other, other areas that you're looking for new revenue? Yeah, so whenever there's a shortfall in our state budget, um, you know, some of the first suggestions are to legalize gambling and then to legalize marijuana. I mean, even if we were to legalize these industries, it would take a while for the state to implement uh, those programs and to begin to generate revenue. It probably wouldn't be a significant amount to begin with, but, you know, it would not be, it's not an immediate fix. And you also have, you know, especially with gambling, you're going to have a lot of uh, social costs that come with with uh with gambling and it you may end up spending more trying to fix the social problems than you than you than you generate in revenue so it could be a net it could be a net loss for the state um but we'll be we'll be looking at other um um uh, revenue sources on the, when the session starts up in january um you know one one area that we've been grappling with over the past few years is how to generate revenue from um, non-residents who who live who live here who own homes here and who live here uh, but are not paying all of the state taxes that a resident would be paying so that'll be a big that'll be a big topic of discussion for us Tina I know it's hard to predict but Amy wants to know how far in the future do you think this new way of doing business will continue uh, how are retailers planning for the future when so much is up in the air you know, they're kind of taking it day by day. And like I said, everyone has kind of had to redo their um, business plan. I think a lot of things that are implemented now are going to stay with us, whether it's, you know, um, online shopping. We're seeing an increase in that where people buy online and they come and they pick up at the store, you know, where you buy it online, you can pick it up two hours later. You don't have to stand in line. You don't have to deal with the crowds. Um, we realize that masks are probably going to be around for a long time, as long as well as, you know, continuous cleaning. Um, so we are prepared for that. And we are looking, you know, at other ways on how can we um, better improve, you know, the customer's experience too. You know, we're into retailtainment now. If you go to a lot of the retailers now, it's not just you go in and you buy an eyeshadow and a lipstick and you walk out. I mean, you can get a facial and a haircut there too, and you have some products that they're selling um, being tested out too, if you wanted to. Um, we're seeing bars that are, you know, starting to, or restaurants that are starting to show up not only in grocery stores, but also in department stores. Um, when you go to your local drugstore now, you know, there's um, clinics in there and you can get your flu shots and things like that. So retail has always been changing and we've always been trying to keep up um, with the trends and what our customers want. John, I want to ask you this. Um, Mike in Kahului recommends having all visitors to Hawaii sign a contract to help enforcement of mask wearing. I think this speaks to uh, some trepidation that the community has with visitors coming from places where there might not be a mask mandate and might not have the awareness. I know Hawaiian Airlines has laid out their travel Pono program where they're trying to, you know, increase uh, visitor awareness of the rules here in Hawaii. But for the tourism economy to grow, of course, we need to also you know, share aloha with our visitors. So how do we rebuild that trust so that we can have uh, tourists come here and have an experience that they enjoy so that they will actually spend money and, and return? You know, I, I for one, uh, favorite tougher language on the use of, of masks. And um, in fact, a couple of weeks ago when we announced the Japan, the opening of the Japan travel, um, you know, I um, had a conversation with Governor Ige about the proclamation carrying the weight of law, and which it does. And so I, I made a statement that day that the state of Hawaii is not asking you to wear a mask, it's ordering you to wear a mask. And, and it's because the, the, uh, the message has got to be very clear to our own local people, as well as to incoming visitors. And uh, I think the, the governor and the four mayors have done a lot to clean up that language to, to uh, actually standardize it because there was some confusion about all the exceptions. But it, you know, it, it goes back to one fundamental fact that, that the, the launch 
The relaunch of our economy and tourism is predicated on Hawaii's ability to keep the COVID curve flat permanently. And at some point, a vaccine is going to help us do that. And until that time, we need to mask, we need to wash our hands, we need to social distance. And um, so, you know, I actually think that uh, the, the market will be responsive to a destination that takes that seriously and draws that kind of line on behalf of its own people, thus keeping the place safe. Well, Speaker Psyche, to that, to that end, the governor has said that um, he can't legally mandate masks um, without the misdemeanor. That misdemeanor essentially is the only punishment that he can lay out, that he can't make it like a traffic ticket, a $100 fine. The legislature has to do that. Do you anticipate that that's something that you'll push through rapidly in January? And, and how long would that take? Yeah, so that's, that, that is something that we'll take up in January um, when, when we convene our session. Um, if we expedite it, you know, hopefully we can make the change and and um, have it become law, you know, within a matter of weeks. Um, in the meantime, um, you know, the, the misdemeanor offense still does apply. Um, it's it's a serious, a misdemeanor offense is a serious offense and I hope that people will comply with, with the mask order. You know, and I wanted to say earlier, just in response to what John was discussing earlier um, um, with uh, 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 the, feelings towards tourists. Um, you know, I suspect that in, in March, um, when we started to see more cases in Hawaii, that we were probably, that those cases were probably um, a result of residents who are traveling to the mainland, to other states or places such as Las Vegas, and then returning with COVID. Um, I think this is why it's really important for the health department to, to have the data and to disclose the data on what the source of, of COVID is and whether or not it is really being transmitted more by tourists or by residents who are traveling outside and returning home. I think it's really important for the public to understand um, how COVID is being contracted and how it's being transmitted and how it's being spread. Well, Monica, I wanna ask you as an employer, you know, getting your, res your, your workers to come back and um, making them feel comfortable with working in a restaurant. You know, you talked about some of the national news uh, regarding some of the concerns about dining out. But of course, we ha we rely on the people who are cooking the food and serving it. How do you make sure that those folks feel comfortable working? Um, and, and would data like the data that Speaker Psyche is talking about, would that help? I definitely think, you know, I personally am very interested in understanding how some of these clusters are occurring or where people um, or how people are being affected and, and definitely personally, I would love to see more transparency in that data. Um, when the first shutdown happened, uh, we did see a lot of uh, maybe about 10, 15% of our, of our employees just did not want to return to work or express concerns about returning to work. And I really want to give, you know, a lot of times people um, overlook the restaurant industry in the sense that you know, a lot of our employees have been working nonstop since, since March. And many of our managers have had to really pick up the slack uh, for, you know, not having employees wanting to come back and return to, to work. Um, and those employees that have returned to work, you know, they're, they're, they're being equally exposed to, to people as well. And, you know, in the workplace, uh, the restaurants are perhaps a little better off in the sense that, we are under a lot of um, policy restrictions in terms of food safety. So making the transition to a higher level of, of safety um, was not all that big of a deal, but definitely um, now you have to have a sanitation specialist. For example, you need to wipe down every table. You have to wipe down high touch points every hour. Uh, you know, you need to provide your guests with sanitizers. And, um, you know, we installed the ionizers, like I said earlier. Um, it's interesting too, because we also have to educate our staff. Um, and so when the transmission rates were going up, I had some staff that were, you know, they're very used to eating together in the lunchroom. They're, they're just a few, you know, few inches apart from each other because they share their lunch. And, you know, I have to come in and say, we can't do this anymore. Uh, sometimes also because they know each other, they've been working with each other for 20 years, 15 years, they're comfortable with each other. Uh, they don't wear, you know, they, they kind of move their mask below their, their nose um, and they're prepping or they're cooking. 
Um, and so as an employer, I've had to kind of remind our staff, even when we're working with each other, we still need to wear our masks because masks have shown that it decreases the transmission significantly. Well, and Ron, I mean, you're working with a lot of people, obviously to distribute that much food means that you have a lot of, a lot of hands that are doing all of that. So how are you managing that as an organization? And also if people do want to help the food bank, um, you know, funds are tight right now, but what is the best way to do that? Well, I'll address the first question because that was something that we implemented uh, protocols and process early. In, in fact, even before long before even we had our first positive in March, we already were ordering N95 masks before anybody even knew what an N95 mask was. We did our research on what was happening in Asia at some of their food banks. So we were being preemptive and pro uh, being progressive in that way when it came to protecting our most valuable resource, and that's our employees, as well as the volunteers that make up their time with us and in our partner agencies that help distribute our food. We educated everybody as much as we can. We provided gloves, we provided masks, we provided uh, cleaning stations. We changed the way we did things in the warehouse, uh, social distance, we're very vigilant about that. And we even limit how many people can come into the warehouse at one time. All of those things that were done quietly behind the scenes, uh, again, long before this became really a, a very uh, robust pandemic here in the islands. Now that we have seen the numbers spike, we've seen the shutdowns continue, I am just absolutely blown away and, and blessed that we are one of the very few food banks across the country where volunteers have not stopped. In fact, we have a, a queue, we have a line of volunteers willing, able, and ready to go. Uh, to pull off a distribution at the stadium, say even this past Monday, that's 175 volunteers. Uh, we have to say no to volunteers every once in a while because we have so much people wanting to make a difference in their community. And again, that is a blessing that some food banks are not experiencing. Uh, when it comes to our workers, none of them shrug their shoulders. None of them put their head down. None of them are asking why. And I think that goes for a lot of other nonprofits doing quality work in the front lines and, and really social service uh, providers who are really making a difference in the community in a very meaningful way, because these are our families. And again, like I said earlier, it's not a cliche. The face of hunger has changed and it includes more people than you even know. And it is our job uh, as advocates for the hungry uh, to remember that we cannot judge. It is no shame in raising your hand. There is no shame in being hungry. And that's something that stigma that's very real. And we saw some of that surface in the islands recently. There is a lesson to be learned there that so many of us may need food assistance even when we least expect it. When somebody comes up in a Tesla or BMW or Mercedes in the distribution line, we are not there to judge. They may have two people working in the visit industry, all of a sudden they have no job. Or worked at a restaurant, they have no job. These are the kinds of real stories that we saw. Again, 78 to 83% of those in lines at our distributions have been affected by COVID in some way. That's very real. Uh, so, you know, we've, again, a lot of, lot of silver linings in all of this, you know, relationships built, trust. But at the end of the day, our law spirit is very much alive, whether it be through generosity of our donors and new people coming forward and, and making a difference in our mission, wanting to make a difference in our mission, donating money, donating their time. Uh, and again, if you if you have the ways and means, please, hawaiifoodbank.org, you can tap on the buttons that you apply to, volunteers, donations. If you need food assistance, we are here. And, and that's something that I, I hope the viewers are hearing tonight is that there is no shame in raising your hand. Thank you for that. Um, Tina, you know, a lot of people are making decisions now when it comes to holiday spending. Of course, funds are limited, but as they decide, you know, if they're not buying 10 gifts, if they're just buying one this year, um, how would you best advise them to, to make those decisions so that they have the biggest impact on our local economy? And we just have a few minutes left. You know, Black Friday has actually started um, in October and you're seeing all these Black Friday sales right now here in November. So there's a lot of deals to be had. Um, so, you know, the best thing is to check online, buy it in store, pick it up um, at curbside, you know, it's contactless, you know, you order it online, you pay online, you drive up into the um, parking lot, pop open your trunk and your purchases are put in there. Um, or you can just go directly to the store. But, you know, we really encourage everybody to go shop in brick and mortar, you know, whether it's online or in person and support our local, our local businesses here, um, you know, we don't have a restaurant card. We didn't have a lot of help. And a lot of these retailers, the only um, assistance that they ever got was PPP loans, you know, and so they're struggling too. 
So buy local, you know, go shopping. <laughs> uh, Monica, I want to give you the last word, just a pitch for local restaurants as we try to do our gift giving, perhaps a gift card is in order. Uh, sure, you know, um, like what Tina mentioned, being a conscientious uh, consumer um, is is all really helpful. And I just do want to make a point for businesses, you know, small and large, our ability to survive this pandemic is really going to depend on, you know, how much capital we have, just like if you lost your job, but if you had savings that can carry you through. Um, it's the same for businesses. Uh, for those businesses that don't have this capital until we have another stimulus uh, from the federal government, um, it's going to be really difficult. I, I am really concerned about, you know, a, a dead spot in between January and, and March uh, when seasonality happens, goes downwards again. Um, so hopefully with the vaccine, hopefully with tourism picking up and hopefully with the stimulus package, you know, we can get back on track in the right direction. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, we thank our guests tonight, House Speaker Scott Psyche, John DeFries, President and CEO of the Hawaii Tourism Authority, Hawaii Food Bank President and CEO Ron Mizutani, Retail Merchants of Hawaii President Tina Yamaki, and Highway Inn owner Monica Toguchi Ryan. Insights will be taking a break during the holidays, but please do join us on January 14th when we'll resume new live episodes. And we, of course, thank you for your support. I'm Yanji Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha.